All right, so it's Wednesday. It's the 1st of June, 2022. Welcome to it. Thank you very much for staying with us. I'm Andy Johnson. Good morning. This is how we're going to get going with the program this morning. This is AM Prime. We're talking with uh, Mr. Ved Sirira moments from now. He's a financial analyst and advisor, and he's looking at the numbers uh, concerning the 2% wage offer from, by the CPO to public employees. What I use on that, is that a starting point? Can the government afford more? Given what, the, what is being said, those are the questions and more that we put to him in that segment. Of course, we have the COVID numbers where we are with COVID-19 in our midst. Also, we have the Newsday question and the answers and the Newsday poll on that issue. We're also talking this morning with an attorney who's a former uh, Speaker in the House of Representatives, Nizam Mohammed, on that issue about what do we do with and about the Privy Council as our final court of, of, of uh, well, our final appellate court the discussions are taking place based on a motion moved in the Senate by Independent Senator Anthony Vera on that. Well, we know that the UNC says it will not support it on the current situations. They say that uh, the court will be subject to too much political influence. And on the back side of the program this morning, uh, after seven, we, we're going back to Mr. Ricky Howard, who's Mr. Ricky Coward, who's one of those residents in parts of uh, Crown Point and Tobago, who objected to, to work going on to, to block roads and to fix roads in order to make way for the expansion of the airport at Crown Point. We want to see where that issue is this morning uh, from the time we spoke with him a couple of weeks ago. So those things and more on the program this morning. We will come back at you in moments from now. Stay with us. As a mother, convenience is a gift. With so many things to juggle every day, I need ease when doing business. Thanks to iWearSolutions.com, I can order my contact lenses, solutions, and even sunglasses all on the go. Registering and ordering are easy. Plus, I get delivery right at my door or collect in-store if I choose. iWearSolutions.com. Now that's convenience in a click. Visit iWearSolutions.com today and enjoy 15% off your first purchase of contact lenses. What's the best way to grab the attention of viewers? Please exercise more patience. You have to be kidding me. Doing what we do best. I'll say at the very least it's a conspiracy of laziness against the people. Join me, Keaton Shaw. And me, Sean Michael Small, for Talking Point. Weekdays from 8 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. We go in-depth on the trending issues and engage the most controversial newsmakers as we get them to account to the people for their actions. You can't go to the government with nothing. You can't go to cabinet yeah. with an with a, with a empty hand, with a wish. I'm mm -hmm. glad that we have it. It's a sober, mature discussion. In the present situation, I expect a continuation of the chaos. Join, Join us, us for, for the, the discussion, discussion, Mondays to Fridays, only on WESN, the content capital. Burning questions, urgent topics, welcome back to One on One, the show where we tackle the most current and pertinent subjects that are affecting all citizens, where we ask the hard questions and have in-depth conversations. What separates One on One from other talk shows is that the conversation stems from a younger perspective on topics that affect the fabric of our society. One on One, Wednesdays at 10 a.m. on WESN Content Capital. Let your voice be heard. Call Madam Fix It on WESN, the only place that effectively helps you with your woes. Having problems getting onto government agencies, water wars, NIS and pension problems, potholes, and much, much more. Call me, Madam Fixit, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, right here on WESN. Let me fix it for you. Every word, every line, every paragraph depicts a real moment in someone's life. A father, a sister, a mother, a brother. We at Newsday are dedicated to you, the people, and through independent, unwavering journalism, strive to always bring your stories to life. Because your stories are more than just words. Newsday, independent and credible. 
Gift giving during a lockdown can still be hassle-free with a gift from FanZone with delivery options available nationwide. Visit and browse our Facebook and Instagram pages for all your official licensed merchandise and apparel and have it delivered to your door. Find us on Facebook and Instagram. FanZone, we've got you covered. And creamy, you'll find it right here. Makes you smile, relax a while, it's fun and good chair. Ooh, enjoy every scoop. Ooh, every taste will get you. We have flavors that you love, a combination special. Come along, enjoy our treats. This is Uncle Pete's. If you live with someone who's tested positive for COVID-19 and has to self-isolate at home, take care of them from a distance and reduce their movement around the house. Give them space, a designated space, and open those windows. If you have to be in contact, mask up, both of you. If you work, stay home from work and don't go out not even to the grocery or pharmacy. And remember, no visitors allowed. Limit the contact to limit the spread. The Trinidad and Tobago Red Cross Society. Mission-based, people-focused, community-driven. All right, welcome back to the program. Well, you know the details of this. The CPO, the government's chief personnel officer, has put 2% on the table for a range of unions representing workers in the public sector. The government is saying that is what it's could, it could afford. But in the uproar that transpired in a big march in Port of Spain a couple of a, a days ago, uh, the unions are saying that will not do. They say, Mr. McLeod, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> the, the president of the uh, Oil Fields Workers Trades Union we're seeing in that march that not even 10% would be enough to quell what is happening. The prime minister has called for patience. He says that there should be understanding in the situation. What is the position? What will happen? The CPO has asked um, those unions to come back to the table between June 10th and uh, June 14th, as a matter of fact, or June 24th, he will be meeting with each of them separately, police, fire, prisons, PSA, and UGFW. What's the position? What's likely to give? After the CPU said, well, ne uh, negotiations are a process. If we started two, it could go up. Maybe not. Mr. Siri Ram is a financial advisor. He's, he's an analyst. He's an expert in these matters. He gives counsel to people on treat money, treatment of money with matters. He's with us this morning. Good morning, sir. Yes, good morning, Andy. Good morning to all viewers and listeners. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, I think uh, the, the basic problem is that the government has not leveled with the population with regards to our difficult financial uh, conditions. And um, we have been getting mixed signals. The latest one, of course, is the massive increase in GDP. And the unions rightfully are saying that, look, if GDP has uh, increased way beyond uh, any previous heights we had before, the now $180 billion dollars, then um, we should be paid a fair share in terms of wages. Uh, I don't think they've gotten an increase since uh, 2014. And uh, they're saying, look, we, we want a share of the pie that the uh, government is saying that we are now enjoying. However, what government has failed to do over the years is to really describe to the population how difficult, how difficult the financial conditions are and we are seeing it on the ground in terms of unemployment, in terms of business closures, and uh, in terms of uh, the destitution and poverty levels. So people are seeing it on the ground, but government has continued to show that, look, all is well. And in fact, that we are now experiencing a windfall. And uh, the assumption there is that this windfall may continue for 
for years to come. All right, but what, what about the fact that uh, in the presentation of the media a review, the finance minister said, okay, so because of what is happening outside of, of anything we are doing, so we, we've gotten some increases because because of, of, of the price of oil. We know why that happened, oil, oil and gas and, and energy prices, generally speaking. Um, but he said he laid out, you know, in, in some people's estimation, a whole canvas of stuff that will have to be taken care of. They, in, in some cases, the government hasn't paid it, you know, its service providers, contractors, and, and, and so on for, for many years in the same kind of way. Uh, he laid out what, what the money will, will, be, will be used to do to pay debts and, uh, and the rest of it. And that pay, trying to settle the, or, or at least improve the situation with workers is one part of it. And the Prime Minister is saying here, this is what he's saying in response to, to the, the response from the workers. I think he would want us to continue keeping people in jobs. You would want us to continue looking for opportunity for us to have an improved payment, but let's not get too carried away with this. 2% increase, well, it covers the period 2014 to 2021. So 1% for the first three years, uh, and then 1% in another three years. Well, you see that the government has not leveled with the population properly, and probably that's why people are yeah. reacting in the way well, they are. Well, the government cannot even afford the 1%, because the government has been uh, leaning on the trade, meaning to say that they have been, they have been uh, taking goods and services without actually paying. And that, that's a sign of uh, um, insolvency, and, and, and this is how government has been carrying on the business for many years now. If you look at the, the 3.081 billion that has been requested uh, in the last review, um, semi-annual review, is that that is only going to partially pay off the debts, and we do not have a list of payables that the government could declare to the population, declare to parliament. And how can you run a $50, $50 billion empire, $60 billion empire, without knowing your list of payables, without having a ledger of your payables? And that is precisely how the government has been funding their, their, their operations, by not paying their bills. Right. So, so, so let's, let's come to that. That is, that is at the center of, of the issue. So if, if the Minister of Finance is saying, well, okay, so what we have got in... Uh, these couple of billions, we have to do this, that, and the other, as well as increase public servant salaries. Why is that not something that is uh, better digested by the trade unions? Yeah, because the government just do not have access to funds. If you look at, I mean, I don't agree with the debt to GDP ratio, but that's the ratio they use to determine government borrowing capacity. And if it's over, I think the minister said it's down to, to 70 some percent. Yes, seventy-two percent or something like that. Yeah, the IMF gave guidelines; it should not go more than forty percent. But nobody uh, obeys those guidelines, and we gradually reach uh, uh, the cliff, and we fall over the cliff, as yeah. in the case of uh, Barbados. But, but he said when when they came in in twenty fifteen, it was like ninety something percent, and they were they, they were able to to bring it down twenty percent to where it is now seventy-two percent. And he was saying that that is a major achievement. You don't agree with that? No, because because what has what has transpired is the the denominator, which is the GDP. Um, they claim that it has increased to 180. So even if your debt remains the same, since uh, your denominator has increased significantly by over 40 billion dollars within within a year, then your ratio changes. But this this raises another issue. What really is GDP? According to Joseph Stiglitz, he's the, I don't know if you recall it. He's a Nobel laureate. Yes. Uh, in a, he said GDP is a phony number. Uh, a no. phony and trade unionists like to quote him. They, they love to, yes, I mean, but but let's let's quote him in all directions. If yes. he says a number, you ask him why. And the reasons are very simple. If, and, and this is where data and data manipulation comes into play. If Bill Gates walk into a bar, suddenly on average, everybody is a billionaire. Is that real? Yes. <laughs> because the, 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 the average income of the people in the bar will, will increase sub, uh, exponentially. <laughs> yes, and economists will come in and say, look, all, on average, all of you all are billionaires, but mm. <laughs> the ones who are getting the free drink from uh, Bill Gates, he doesn't feel like a billionaire. Yeah, well, I'm glad you, you, you bring that kind of analogy because there are, there are those people, economists, uh, 
Dr. Atson and others are saying that um, the average salary in Trinidad and Tobago is somewhere around six to eight thousand dollars a month, and that goes nowhere in addressing the the the, the rate of inflation and meeting people's basic needs it doesn't cover exactly exactly and and i think this is where we've been fooled all these years we've been fooled with regards to gdp now if you look at gdp uh, let's look at the practical aspect okay the creator of that particular uh, measure he said look this is only applicable in countries that are making things a manufacturing thing that you can measure but we are, have a very complex society where we have services uh, comprising a large part of that uh, GDP compon component of GDP. And services, as you know, is, is something very slippery. If you are manufacturing, so we depend on what happens in the oil sector to, to determine GDP. But what about the distribution of that uh, income? It's not necessarily goes to the, to the small man. In fact, a lot of that uh, increase comes to government and then government really has to, to make, meet their, their bills, meet their recurrent expenditures and meet their debt service and so on. So very little of that really filters off uh, the crumbs, uh, filters off to, to the ordinary man in the street. So, so you're so, saying that, uh, that, that um, we should not be putting this emphasis on, on the services sector because somebody like Angela Leloy would not want to hear you say that because you know, she's among the cohort of people who promote even further development uh, and, and sort of rise in the question of the services sector. People have people been talking about that for, for, for years. So what you're saying is that, that, that the, the, the importance there is misplaced? Yeah, the service sector. And that is why uh, Trump had said, look, we have to change the composition of the economics uh, the economy in in United States and start manufacturing things again. You cannot just depend on on printing money and expect to survive in the long term. And that's a, that's a predicament for most countries where you depend on a service sector. A service sector really, if you look at it, you look at the banking sector. How can the banking sector thrive in such an environment where both its partners? Both is uh, that the depositors are falling apart and the, and the borrowers are also falling apart. And yet the banking sector is showing significant growth. What real um, addition, real real addition to the to, to the economy does the banking sector bring? So, what do you think is it? What do you think is the reason for it? The reason for it is that modern economy needs money to to, to really lubricate the economy. But I'm saying that those service sectors can only thrive, should only thrive, if the other sectors of the economy, the real sectors of the economy, are actually thriving. Failing that is just is just another government that is taxing the people beyond the capacity to pay. And that is what has happened over the years, Andy, is our economy, in terms of infrastructure and so on, has grown to such an extent that we can no longer afford it. We can no longer afford the large infrastructure that we have created. Granted, that is why maintenance is very low. You're seeing it on the roads. We cannot maintain the roads. We cannot maintain the buildings. The uh, paint is peeling off. And that, that, that's a sign of a deteriorating society. So what ought to happen is government should be leveling with the people and say, look, we do not have the money to sustain our lifestyle as we did before. And adjustments have to take place at the top level, starting with the president, the prime minister, the parliamentarian, and take a cut in salary. You cannot impose, try to impose austerity measures, and you are asking for an increase uh, at the, the, the top level. And if they say, look, our economy is in a very shaky position, and you're seeing with government finances, we have to make adjustments, and we are making those adjustments by example, and taking a cut in pay by 10%, 15%. Some cases uh, with, the, with the COVID, some uh, uh, parliamentarians and prime ministers took a, a 25% cut. But we have not done that. I, I, we, I, we were in a kind of situation like this in 1986, the end of 1986, 1987. And it is, it is, it is not with ill will that one says that the PNM in opposition was foremost among those who, who, who opposed what was, what was done, what was proposed, and what was put in place under that administration. Not so? Well, the, as opposition, you can oppose everything, but reality will set in. And, and as far as I, I've 
I've passed through the 1980s recession. I was uh, uh, a senior officer at the bank, at the, and, and in the early 90s, a senior officer at another international bank. They were operating in Trinidad. And I tell you, it was very, very difficult. And we have to adjust whether we like it or not. We are not in a position like America and in Europe where they, these people are just printing money and that is, that is what is keeping the economy afloat. And you're going to find, ultimately, they are selling, they have been selling US dollars to, to maintain their the lifestyle. And that is virtually coming to an end. And it's a currency war that is taking place in the world today. And we uh, appear to operate Trinidad as if we are independent of events in the world uh, as, as it stands. And I think our priorities are all mixed up. So what has to be done? I agree with the Prime Minister. He, he just can't afford it. He just can't afford it. And I don't know if you saw TSTT. They're just laying off another 400 plus employees. Yesterday, yeah. After a week of uncertainty as to what will happen. Right. So if the economy was doing good, that's the time you start employing people. But more and more people are coming on the breadline. And I think uh, our policy uh, makers should recognize our predicament and stop pretending as if we are a rich country. Still, we are not a rich country. I could say Guyana, Guyana's position is turning into what Trinidad was a few years ago. And Trinidad is turning to what Guyana <laughs> the present, or, or was a few years ago. And, and and those are facts we cannot, we can shut our eyes to it, but it's there, it's very much there. So let's, 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 let's come back where we started. If if the the workers and, and the trade unions are to exercise patience and, and reason, uh, as the Prime Minister is, call, is calling for, what has to be done? What must the Prime Minister and the rest of the cabinet and the government do in order to get people to understand the situation better and to exercise patience and reason? But there, there's no... You cannot be um, talking from two sides of the, your mouth at, at uh, government level and expect patience and, and, and reason from, from the unions. The, the unions are there to fight for increased salaries. And the Minister of Finance already said that we are doing well. We have seen the light, end of, uh, the light at the end of the tunnel. And I think that has been a message throughout, despite the facts on the ground showing otherwise. And uh, the question of... Uh, being truthful is extremely important at this stage. And the, the, the union will say, really, if that is the case, why are you not adjusting and, yeah. and in your belt as well? Yeah, but, but he's saying that, the, the, the Minister of Finance is saying that, okay, so we have some change here, but we have all these things, this long list of, of commitments, and we have to meet some of them, or if not all of them, to the same extent that we are, we are saying that we can afford a 2% for now. Although the CPO, in calling back the unions to, to the meet, uh, later this month is saying, well, 2% is just a starting point. So we're giving a, a sense that we could go up higher, but the, 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 the facts are being laid out by others saying, well, this is what we have to do, and this is what we could afford to you all now. We are operating on an inverted pyramid where few people are really creating the wealth in this country, and, and that's in the oil sector. That's about it. And the rest of us are depending on, on the, the oil and gas to sustain us. And I'm saying that we have to tilt the pyramid now. And we have not diversified the economy to put people back to work in, in productive sectors. So we cannot continue as it is. And uh, whilst uh, the, the government, and I, I'm glad you recognize it, that government is saying that they have these long outstanding tables. So the first question parliament must be, must insist on is that what is the extent of the payable? They have not paid the, the cane farmers as yet. Uh, probably over 100 million outstanding on that payment. So government has been just riding roughshod through the economy and not and being very, very selective to with regards to the bills that they are settling. So you know you, we we cannot we we are reaching ahead now, and I cannot disagree with unions' position uh, because the government is speaking is giving uh, mixed signals and we need to level with the population and let's admit but you see one of the problems government will have is that if they admit that the financials are very bad and they are is that they will have to cease all those major projects that they've started to embark on because those major projects are not essential at this point in time they are not essential you do not when your house is on fire you do not hire engineers and, and architects to extend the house. You have to out that fire first. 
and the, but the government has been trying to do both and that that is not possible it's not practical yeah i, I, I some people would say well you have to do these things to encourage sort of confidence and and, and boost people's morale and let let something be seen to be happening but it, it's yeah. just illusory i agree and um that will be just uh, catering to the to the needs or the, the the demands of a few and we have to decide do we cater continue to cater for the demands of a few and um, and that i wouldn't say 1% maybe 5% or whatever but do we manage the economy for the benefit of a few at the expense of the remainder before the covid before covid uh, there were reports saying that poverty levels was over 20% yeah. can you what it is now can we imagine what it is now what is exactly is poverty poverty uh, in my uh, definition is uh, my my uh, idea of of poverty is that people are not getting a square meal for the day so how do we cater for that we have to share the burden of pain we cannot continue as it is building new roads when potholes are are increasing like the the monkey pox i mean uh, it's it's not possible we we have been hit by two two major events one is uh, the the war in ukraine that is impact upon impacting upon the world with regards to food security and prior to that was covid covid we haven't finished with covid as yet you saw what happened in china shanghai was locked down for perhaps a month yeah you could, you could see the impact in world trade because china is a, is, is a, shanghai is a city of over 20 um, million persons with a major uh, global uh, port that has been locked down and and they're now reopening it but the point is all of that has impacted our conventional way of uh, managing global economy and all of that is questioned now all right so, this is, right so so whichever way we look at it um in the days ahead we face some rough weather socially and economically very very rough weather and i've been preaching this for the last 7 years because i saw all the signs on the wall you cannot we are we are a mining town we are a mining town and you saw many mining towns when they when the actual product the gold or silver or something is depleted that's about it what happens yeah you shut it down and perhaps use the buildings for for making movies or western movies and yeah. that we have uh, to as you say, I, I i like your analogy we have to go but i just want to repeat that you see we are fast becoming where Guyana was two decades or three decades ago and they are fast becoming where we were in the same period so we, we the tables are turning the tables are turning and we we, we should accept it with grace because yes. when when times were good we splurged and we wasted so we should not be crying now all right Saying, look let's admit our situation and move on to the next stage yeah okay thank you very much you are always very clinical and we appreciate that very much very serious i'm still with that thank you very much Thank you very much. Stay with us. When we come back, we tell you the numbers and we move forward from there. We take a look around the region as we continue on this edition of AM Prime. The issue, the continued rise in the price of flour and its impact on the cost of living in Trinidad and Tobago. How should we go about it? I want to ask you what has been revealed to you about the state of vulnerability in the country because of, of this exercise and because of, of what we're going through. Is the government losing the war on the vaccine front? The discussion should revolve around the common good for the greatest number of people in Trinidad and Tobago. How do we inculcate a sense of respect and regard for people who may not be of your own political ilk or persuasion. The communities are not being used by political opportunists. So I, I, when the I tables are turned, when the tables are turned, it's the same, it's the same way. Okay, this has been 10 Questions. I'm Andy Johnson, and we'll see you next time. I am Rondell Donoa, attorney at law and host of Strictly Legal on WESN Content Capital. Strictly Legal is a legal program geared towards informing you, the public, of your legal rights, responsibilities, and remedies. So be viewing Thursdays, 10 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. Join me, Sule A. Joseph, 
as I delve into the day-to-day -day psychological issues plaguing our society. We will discuss behaviors that encompass the biological influences, social pressures, and environmental factors that affect how you think, act, and feel. Sight, Thursdays at 11 a.m. Only on WESN, Content Capital. The best way to get are at thebesttoys.com. Shop for the best brands you love at the best prices. Like VTech, LeapFrog, Fisher-Price, Play-Doh, Hot Wheels, Bobby, Coco Melon, LOL, Baby Alive, Crayola. Visit us in-store at Forces Flagship Mac Bean. Shop online now at thebesttoys.com. Order via call or WhatsApp at 32DBEST to order. And remember, we have the best toys at the best prices. Is it politics? What is it? Is it that nobody cares about sports? The kind of support that sport used to get in the past is, is no longer here. The thing is, taking a knee doesn't mean that that's the only thing you're doing on. Right. Taking a knee along with other stuff. Samantha, what are you looking forward to when you return home to Trinidad and Tobago after winning the title? Thank you very much for speaking it into existence. Is it no pressure on Nicholas Ball? It makes me more motivated to work hard and to go out there and rep the right and black. Why are we sending a team to the Winter Olympics? There are a number of Trinbagonians who are in the diaspora and have grown up in winter sport. It's an opportunity that the Trinidad and Tobago Olympic Committee will not close the door. I also believe in the players that we have. Once you can motivate the players, you can get the best out of them. I a reminder from WESN, we urge you to protect yourself and others from the spread of COVID-19. Stay safe by taking some simple precautions. Clean your hands often. Use soap and water or an alcohol-based hand rub. Maintain a safe distance from anyone who is coughing or sneezing. Wear a mask. Don't touch your eyes, nose or mouth. Cover your nose and mouth with your bent elbow or a tissue when you cough or sneeze. Stay at home. If you have a fever, cough and difficulty breathing, seek medical attention. Following the above can help us all to help each other. Okay, Mark will stay with us up ahead, our discussion with former House Speaker, former Member of Parliament, and other things, Nizam Mohammed, where he stands on the question of getting rid of the Privy Council and bringing the Caribbean Court of Justice as our final appellate jurisdiction in Trinidad and Tobago. There's a debate on that going on in the Parliament, moved by Independent Senator Anthony Vieira. We know the UNC's position, they will never support it under current arrangements. But before we get there, let's take a look at what the numbers are this morning in COVID-19, the new positive cases, the totally recovered patients, uh, patients in hospital, active cases and the like. So here they are as they come up. 148,460, the total recovered patients, 9,207. That's the total active positive cases, 3,917. It's the number of people who've died from COVID. 161,584. That's the total positive cases reported since we began the counting on March 12, 2020. 149, that's the new positive cases reported in the 24 hours up to the end of the day yesterday. And 184, the total patients in hospital. That's the, that's the clinical update, as they call it, as of the end of the day yesterday, May 31st, 2022. So what's the news there, Paul? The question is, do you believe that the child marriage is equivalent to child abuse? That's a debate going on in the papers at the moment. So here are some of the responses. Is it equivalent? It is. Who in their right mind could look at their child and marry them off to hardback adults? Race or religion doesn't matter to these people. Well, I won't pronounce the rest there. You see it on the screen. That's literally what somebody said. The other, another response, child marriage is abuse. Those marriages turn out to be very unhappy eventually. You are just a maid, sad. Another response, people please realize that a 16-year-old and a 17-year-old up until they are 17 years old are 364 days old, which is called a child. 
And the last response, yes it is, if you have to consent, and by reason of choice, why child marriages? It is gross and heinous. So those are the responses. Uh, let's see if we can get straight to our next discussion now with former Member of Parliament and Speaker of the House of Representatives, Attorney Nizam Mohammed. The question is, what do we do? Do we seek to remove the Privy Council as our last um, stop legally and embrace the CCJ for what it is or stay there where we are? Good morning, sir. Good to see you. Very good morning to you, Andy. How are you keeping? Very good, thanks. And how are you? I am okay, thank you. All right, good. Well, so, so let's talk, what's, what's, do you have a personal position? Do you have an institutional position on this matter? Well, this is something that has been on the, on the burner, whether it was in the, on the front or the back burner. It has been on the burner for the longest while. And um, it is only within recent times I learned that there is actually a motion uh, before the Senate uh, calling for the um, abolition of appeals to the Privy Council and directing our appeals to our local Caribbean Court of Justice instead. And uh, But that is as far as we have gone. You know, many years ago, the late Lloyd Best uh, had observed that we, we had too much uh, media in, in Trinidad and Tobago. <laughs> And those are many, many years ago. I, I still think that we have a lot of media, but at the same time, I believe that we are bereft of sufficient information on a number of topics that ought to be given uh, special attention and more detailed examination. And the question of, re the, of the retention of the Privy Council as our final court of appeal is one such question and one such matter that ought to have been um, having serious discussions um, at the highest levels of the society. And uh, my observation is that I, I, I do not believe that We've gotten that kind of organization to cater for such a facility so that we can uh, properly and effectively air our views in a very thorough manner so that we can um, have clear-cut ideas in our minds as to how we approach this question to be or not to be. And um, the question is still left hanging in the air. We are having a debate in the parliament, in the Senate, by one of the independent senators, and you will correct me if I am wrong. And um, debate, the, the debate is ongoing, uh, for starters, because of the importance of such a debate. Um, you know the way the business of the House or rather the Senate is arranged, uh, the, the private member's motion is facilitated once per month um, on one of the sittings every month. Yeah. One day is put aside, one afternoon is put aside for private motion. So if, one, if a motion starts uh, today in the Senate, for example, and uh, at 6 o'clock, uh, members of the House are ready to go home. It means that the matter is adjourned and we are not going to hear about this in the media for perhaps another um, three or four weeks, for another month. To my mind, this particular matter ought to have been arranged by both all, all sides of the House because of its importance. I think that it ought to be to have been arranged in such a way that we should have had an ongoing debate so that there would not have been a break in the discussion, public discussions. And more than that, whether or not other interested parties ought to have participated in the debate 
not in the formal sense, but um, in fora that will facilitate public discussions and um, attract public attention. And this is something that is not happening. And yeah, I believe that the, um, the whole issue is not being given the kind of focus and attention that it ought to be given by the authorities. And as a result of that, we are having a very lukewarm um, approach to this subject, which to my mind is insufficient. At the end of the day, the, um, all our courts are extremely important. Cumulatively, they are all important and more particularly our final court of appeal, which at the present is the Privy Council. What do we do with the 60 years since independence? What do we do? And what are the agencies that are facilitating any kind of discussion, if any at all? Is the Law Association showing an interest? Or is it that we have a body of judges who are prepared to lend their views on this matter? Um, what about the Southern Assembly of Lawyers? What about, uh, do we have a Caribbean Bar Association? And that sort of thing. Um, as a matter of fact, I believe that the right place, uh, the, um, or rather the, the, the discussion should be facilitated at the Caribbean level, both at the local and the Caribbean level, at the same time if we are to generate some kind of interest yeah. in the public in the public concerning this matter. Right. At least we have with three or four, four or five uh, other CARICOM member states who have done that, Belize and Guyana and, and, and a couple others who've done that. They've, they've, they've crossed that hurdle. And you're saying that, that, that it, it should, because what is missing is, is that kind of arrangement for further discussion of the implications of it and so on. And you mentioned the, the Southern Assembly and Blowers. It just so happens that um, I've been trying to, to reach out to people there and I've gotten, I've not gotten no response from the people who I'm pictured with, with yet. But let's go back to the mechanics of, of the parliamentary process. So you, you're saying that and it, this is important for people to understand. So an independent senator comes up and, and brings out as a private member's motion. Um, and that was a couple of, of, well, last week or, or the week before. You say that there will be no discussion in the parliament over that on, until he, unless he comes back and, and revives that in, in a month's time. Yes, he's going to come back. And the, and, 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 the, and the debate will, will continue. And uh, they, they, there will be no cohesion in what is being discussed. Um, no facility has been provided for the continuation of the debate so that we can properly focus on the issues that are being raised and the issues that are being thrashed out. And uh, it is, you know, a sort of a hopscotch approach <laughs> on a matter of this nature, which to my mind is too important for us to be approaching this matter in such a, a manner. And I, would, I am disappointed with the leadership of the parliament in failing to organize this, uh, to have this debate organized in a more effective way. It is, it is an indication of something that is rather troubling at, um, uh, in, in, in the wider society, if you permit me. Yes. And that is at every level in our society, when it comes to mat matters of national importance, matters of bread and butter, matters of life and death, matters of people's personal security, matters of the safety of our children and um, the, the welfare and well-being of our, our women folk, those who need to be uh, protected in special ways. There seems to be a disconnect in every direction. And uh, it is something that you may or you may not agree with, but I feel that the institutions themselves 
They have gone into a state of paralysis, if not some kind of stupor. And uh, they seem to be unmindful of their public responsibilities. And uh, the, 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 the need to connect with the public to ensure that the public is moving along with whatever development is taking pl place within uh, our very, very important institutions that have to do with the effective governance of our country. All right, so what are the, who, who, who uh, or, or what are the, 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 the offices or the persons, the positions in the parliament when you refer to the leadership of the parliament? We're talking about, about which offices? Well, yeah, here we have um, the, the, the independent senator who filed the motion. Anthony Vera. He, yes, that is Senator Vera. He is the one who filed the motion. Uh, once a motion is still filed in the parliament, the process begins for the tabling of the motion in the parliament and that sort of thing, placing the, um, the motion on the order paper and waiting on the day when parliament will facilitate in its routine manner um, a, 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 a hearing or an airing of the motion. And I believe prior to that, as the motion is placed on the order paper, you have a leader of government business. You would have someone amongst the independent senators who is coordinating uh, for the effective um, functioning of the of the business of the or, or, of the parliament. And you would have a leader of the opposition in the parliament as well. Yes. These are the individuals, to my mind, who should who ought to confer with the administration of the of the Senate and uh, make out a case for this particular motion to be handled in a certain way because of its importance, importance at the international level, importance at the Caribbean level. And more than that, you go, you go further by engaging agencies that may have an interest in this, uh, a special interest in this matter. The Law Association of Trinidad and Tobago, the Southern Assembly of Lawyers maybe, um, the, 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 the Hugh Wooding the Law, Law School. School. Yeah. You have a staff there. These people are engaged in the development of Caribbean jurisprudence they are teaching our students. Our students ought to have an interest in this matter. This ought to be a matter of very, very, in, in which they ought to have a very keen interest. What are the implications? You know? And um, so you may not only have, you may not only have the Hugh Wooding Law School. By extension, you may have the Norman Manley Law School. You have I understand we have law school in the Bahamas and in Barbados, in Barbados as well. Yes. All of these um, uh, faculties of law, or branches of the law school, whatever, they ought to be involved in this exercise. At one time, we heard that we were building a branch of UEW of UE down in, in South Trinidad near to Davie or somewhere there. In, in Davie, yes. Yeah, for the establishment of a, of a faculty of law, if I am not mistaken. Yes. And then when you have regime change, you have policy change. As if it is, you know, well, that is another matter for, for yes. discussion. Yes. But um, which, to my mind, um, is something that is very, very worrisome at times. However, the point I am making is this, that um, you, are, you raise the question, who are the... What are the agencies who ought to be involved in all of this? You may have individual lawyers. I have seen one or two individuals who have written on this particular matter and their very scholarly work um, must be acknowledged and appreciated because they are dealing with the essence of our, our jurisprudence and the very seat of the administration of justice in the Caribbean. This is something new 
<clears throat> we may regard it as something new that is emerging. And I am very, um, I'm very unhappy with the lack of interest and the, 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 the casual and lackadaisical manner in which this entire matter is approached. I am sorry that <clears throat> the Senate did not provide the leadership and did not uh, establish the incentives so as to generate the interest in the matter at the national and the Caribbean level, if not at the international level. Yeah, well, I mean, we thank you very much for that because this is what we are seeking to do here. Uh, and it's, it, it's, it's important what you're saying without, um, we haven't gotten to and we probably won't, it's not necessary at this point to get into the pros and cons one way. But what you're seeing here is the institutional arrangements for the discussions are lacking and they are important, not only in Trinidad and Tobago, but around the region. And that, that, that's, that's very critical, that's very critical variable in, in, in what we're having here because all the, the, the issues surrounding it have to be understood by as many of us as possible, and that's what you're promoting. Yeah, exactly. If we are, I think that the, um, my personal position is, I think that the time has come for us to take a decision one way or another. If I am to participate in such a decision, I am in support of the replacement of the, uh, of the Privy Council by the Caribbean Court of Justice. But, 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 <laughs> at this stage, you and I ought to appreciate the importance of winning the confidence of the public in having a Caribbean Court of Justice as our final Court of Appeal in the Caribbean. We want to know that there are all the mechanisms in place in order to ensure that the integrity that such an institution has to actually carry from the very inception is assured. We want to know that we are comfortable in dealing with our counterparts in all the other Caribbean countries. We want to know that we have a Caribbean uh, Judicial and Legal Services Commission, which will in part be responsible for the operations of a Caribbean Court of Justice. We want to make sure that such a body is beyond reproach. We want to have confidence in such a body. And I believe that this particular exercise, Andy, can provide the Caribbean for a change, can provide the Caribbean with an opportunity for us to be a little more Caribbean with each other, for us to feel nearer to each other. In the same way you, in your capacity, as a media person, you have access to so many of us because you it is your job it is your as i was saying um in in, in 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 a lighter moment you have been standing guard for far too long for us to disregard a request when a request is made from you because we have to understand the role that you have you have played in your lifelong career as a media person you, it is people who are establishing and making these connections who have to take the initiative and bring us closer together. You know, I can veer off and go on, 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 on other matters. For, uh, I, I had the pleasure of meeting you two weeks ago at a book launch. An extremely important book has been launched in Trinidad. I heard nothing about the book after the launch on that evening. We are not having a discussion. Andy Johnson is not um, presiding over a discussion with four or five persons who would have read the book and um, to tell to tell us, um, you know, the importance of this book 
and where this book fits into the development of the labor movement and the development of our society, etc., etc., etc. You know, um, we are not talking enough in our country. Yeah. We are quarreling too much, <laughs> and we are not talking enough. Yeah, that's that's a, that, that, that's a very profound point, uh, at which we, 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 have, we have to leave it there. But we will continue the discussion, I promise you, because this is important, and that's why we... we, we yes, you establish your forum, my, my, my friend, because you have a duty, you owe a duty to the Caribbean. And I am telling you that you have taken up a, a, a matter that you should carry through, and you should uh, uh, garner support because this is too much an important matter for us to treat as another news item. I want to thank you for the opportunity. I know we have overrun our time. But that was important. But thank you very much. We will continue the discussion. And anytime, anytime, my friend. All the best. Thank you very much, Nizam Mohammed, former member of parliament, former uh, speaker of the House of Representatives and attorney. Uh, we go straight to the news on the, on the hour. At this point, we come back on the other side with Mr. Coward on the situation in Tobago. Stay with us. Seven is out. All day is in. WESN News on the hour. Every day we communicate through stories. Stories of ourselves, our challenges, our goals, our experiences, and our aspirations. Storytelling is an art, an art that we have mastered. WESN Film Studios comprises a collaborative team of experts with extensive industry experience locally, regionally, and internationally. The ability of your business to successfully communicate with your preferred audience depends on the strength of the stories you tell. Your vision should be communicated in a high quality, professional, and creative way. From concept to post-production, advertising to film, multi-camera productions, live events, streaming and virtual conferencing, we are WESN Film Studio. Let your own unique voice be heard and your vision realized. Call us today at 628-5835 for your next production. Is it politics? What is it? Is it that nobody cares about sport? The kind of support that sport used to get in the past is it's no longer here. The thing is, taking a knee doesn't mean that that's the only thing you're doing, aren't you? Right. Taking a knee along with other stuff. Samantha, what are you looking forward to when you return home to Trinidad and Tobago after winning the title? Thank you very much for speaking it into Ecosystem. Is it now pressure on Nicholas Ball? It makes me more motivated to work hard and to go all day and wrap the red, white, and black. Why are we sending a team to the Winter Olympics? There are a number of Trinbegonians who are in the diaspora and have grown up in winter sport. It's an opportunity that the Trinidad and Tobago Olympic Committee will not close the door on. I also believe in the players that we have. Once you can motivate the players, you can get the best out of them. I What's the best way to grab the attention of viewers? Please exercise more patience. You have to be kidding me. Doing what we do best. I'll say at the very least it's a conspiracy of laziness against the people. Join me, Keaton Shaw. And me, Sean Michael Small, for Talking Point. Weekdays from 8 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. We go in-depth on the trending issues and engage the most controversial newsmakers as we get them to account to the people for their actions. You can't go to the government with nothing. You can't go to cabinet yeah. with an with a, with a empty hand, with a wish. I'm mm -hmm. glad that we're having this is a sober, mature discussion. In the present situation, I expect a continuation of the chaos. Join, Join us for, for the, the discussion. discussion. Mondays to Fridays, only on WESN, the content capital.
I am Rondell Donoa, attorney at law and host of Strictly Legal on WESN Content Capital. Strictly Legal is a legal program geared towards informing you, the public, of your legal rights, responsibilities, and remedies. So be viewing Thursdays, 10 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. Join me, Sule A. Joseph, as I delve into the day-to-day -day psychological issues plaguing our society. We will discuss behaviors that encompass the biological influences, social pressures, and environmental factors that affect how you think, act, and feel. Sight, Thursdays at 11 a.m. Only on WESN, Content Capital. Don't keep yourself handcuffed. We continue to receive calls from members of the viewing public whose cable provider is flow and cannot receive WESN. We advise that you unfortunately reside on the original flow platform. If you wish to receive WESN's high quality programming, you must contact flow to be upgraded to the new flow Evo platform. Call flow now and demand your upgrade. A reminder from WESN, we urge you to protect yourself and others from the spread of COVID-19. Stay safe by taking some simple precautions. Clean your hands often. Use soap and water or an alcohol-based hand rub. Maintain a safe distance from anyone who is coughing or sneezing. Wear a mask. Don't touch your eyes, nose or mouth. Cover your nose and mouth with your bent elbow or a tissue when you cough or sneeze. Stay at home. If you have a fever, cough and difficulty breathing, seek medical attention. Following the above can help us all to help each other. Hi, welcome back in the program. Well, we can tell you that Mr. Ricky Coward will be experiencing some challenges trying to reach him. He has other commitments. We're not sure what will happen there. But in the meantime, let's take a look around the region and see where we go. We start with Barbados. The cabinet there has approved the, the, the construction and the formation of what they're calling a reform commission. We have a report on that from Barbados today. Let's take a look. Attorney General Dale Marshall explained that a reform, which he described as a far and wider, more intensive process, will be undertaken. Cabinet has approved the establishment of the Constitution Reform Commission. I made a distinction between review, which is just looking at something that's there, and reform, which is in fact a, a far wider and more intensive ranging process. So we're embarking on a process of constitutional reform. Cabinet has agreed to the composition to the establishment of the commission, it has agreed to the, to the composition of that commission. All of the persons who we recommend for appointment have been contacted have, and have agreed to serve. And therefore the cabinet secretary is now in the process of liaison with Her Excellency for the preparation and signing of those warrants. Uh, you, you are appointed not a, well, under a special instrument called a warrant of appointment. And I'm hopeful that those things will all be accomplished between now and the middle of June. Marshall was speaking while having his blood pressure checked as part of an initiative to commemorate May Measurement Month. All right, so that's Barbados. Let's take a look at what's in Grenada now, where the World Bank has approved the financing of a loan for 25 million US dollars uh, for recovery and resilience to program, pro programmatic development policy. The GBN tells us more about that. The World Bank's Board of Executive Directors approved the financing of U.S. $25 million for Grenada's first recovery and resilience programmatic development policy credit. The financing will help support the country's recovery by promoting a greener and more climate-resilient economy, improving sustainability and greater accountability for fiscal management. In a statement on Thursday, it says, before the pandemic, Grenada's steadfast reform path to build economic resilience had attained solid growth, debt sustainability, and poverty reduction. However, the COVID-19 pandemic caused massive socioeconomic impacts, which are expected to exacerbate the pre-existing vulnerabilities of Grenada as a small island developing state. 
Lilia Burunkiuk, World Bank Country Director for Caribbean Countries, said, and I quote, while COVID-19 has slowed growth, the government of Grenada continues to work to enhance climate resilience, diversify the economy, and encourage inclusive growth. The country is poised for sustainable recovery by including a sound disaster risk management framework, increased digitalization, and wider use of renewable energy in their operations. Unquote. The project will assist in establishing a comprehensive disaster risk management legislation to utilize resources efficiently and effectively, promote wider use of renewable energy, and improve energy efficiency. Additionally, increased use of technology is expected with the passage of legislation and other plans to increase data safeguards. In addition, it will support the government in strengthening fiscal accountability and mitigating risk to fiscal sustainability, including support for climate change and gender considerations in the budgeting process. The project will also assist with the implementation of a permanent unemployment insurance program to enhance the labor market's resilience. Another objective is to build the capacity of Grenada's statistical system to enable more informed and timely policy making. Grenada also received World Bank funding for U.S. $15 million U.S. this month to make Grenada's transport infrastructure more resilient to the impacts of climate change and natural hazards. The Grenada Resilience Improvement Project will finance interventions to project principal transport corridors against coastal erosion fueled by sea level rise and flooding at the crossing of the country's largest river. And we go to Guyana now, where news source Guyana is reporting on a development in which the leader of the opposition has turned down a request by the office of the president for consultations on constitutional appointments between the president and the opposition. Three weeks after the first meeting between President Air Finale and opposition leader Aubrey Norton, the president's office wrote to the opposition leader on Friday, requesting that he attends a meeting today for the restart of the consultations. Instead, Mr. Norton wrote to the Minister of Governance, Gilda Shera, this morning and informed her that the meeting should have been held no more than one week after the initial meeting three weeks ago, in keeping with their agreement and joint statement. Mr. Norton said his schedule would not have allowed him to attend the meeting today. He accused the government of not sticking to the original agreement and still holding back on information regarding some of the nominees for the various constitutional commissions. Norton also said he would like to see the consultation regarding the confirmation of a Chancellor and Chief Justice placed on the agenda, since it is of national importance. He has already indicated that he will support the confirmation of Justice Yonet Cummings as Chancellor and Roxanne George as Chief Justice. He said the government's position that the president is not prepared to consult on the judicial appointments at this stage is a gross dereliction of the concerns of civil society groups and the people of Guyana. In a Facebook Live statement this afternoon on the consultations, the president said that he was not given any reason for the opposition leader's absence from the meeting today. On the 27th of May, Minister Gail Teixeira invited Mr. Norton to a meeting here at the Office of the President to continue the consultation with me for today at 2 p.m. As I said, it is now 2.34 p.m. and the leader of the opposition has absented himself from this meeting. We have received no verbal or oral communication from the leader of the opposition or his office. Notwithstanding that also, in our letter, which I will go through in a few moments, to the leader of the opposition inviting him to this meeting, we made it very clear to him that in the event that he may not attend, he can share his thoughts with us in writing. Although a letter from the opposition leader's office to the president's office bearing today's date was shared with the media up to this afternoon, the president said he did not receive any communication from Mr. Norton. Not only did he not attend today, but he has not provided anything in writing. I just wanted to take this time to outline 
the factual basis of this consultation. I have not spoken before on this issue in the press. Despite the false narrative in the last few days by Mr. Norton, because I believe that staying true to the Constitution, these are important national issues. And we'll be back in a moment. Stay with us. What's the best way to grab the attention of viewers? Please exercise more patience. You have to be kidding me. Doing what we do best. I'll say at the very least it's a conspiracy of laziness against the people. Join me, Keaton Shaw. And me, Sean Michael Small, for Talking Point. Weekdays from 8 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. We go in-depth on the trending issues and engage the most controversial newsmakers as we get them to account to the people for their actions. You can't go to the government with nothing. You can't go to cabinet yeah. with an with a, with a empty hand, with a wish. I'm mm -hmm. glad that we're having this a sober, mature discussion. In the present situation, I expect a continuation of the chaos. Join, Join us, us for, for the, the discussion, discussion, Mondays to Fridays, only on WESN, the content capital. Burning questions, urgent topics, welcome back to One on One, the show where we tackle the most current and pertinent subjects that are affecting all citizens, where we ask the hard questions and have in-depth conversations. What separates One on One from other talk shows is that the conversation stems from a younger perspective on topics that affect the fabric of our society. One on One, Wednesdays at 10 a.m. on WESN Content Capital. Let your voice be heard. Call Madam Fix It on WESN, the only place that effectively helps you with your woes. Having problems getting onto government agencies, water wars, NIS and pension problems, potholes, and much, much more. Call me, Madam Fixit, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, right here on WESN. Let me fix it for you. Is it politics? What is it? Is it that nobody cares about sport? The kind of support that sport used to get in the past is, is no longer here. The thing is, taking a knee doesn't mean that that's the only thing you're doing now, Andy. Right. Taking a knee along with other stuff. Samantha, what are you looking forward to when you return home to Trinidad and Tobago after winning the title? Thank you very much for speaking it into existence. Is it now pressure on Nicholas Ball? It makes me more motivated to work hard and to go all day and rep the red, white, and black. Why are we sending a team to the Winter Olympics? There are a number of Trinbegonians who are in the diaspora and have grown up in winter sport. It's an opportunity that the Trin and the Big Olympic Committee will not close the door. I also believe in the players that we have. Once you can motivate the players, you can get the best out of them. Every word, every line, every paragraph depicts a real moment in someone's life. A father, a sister, a mother, a brother. We at Newsday are dedicated to you, the people, and through independent, unwavering journalism, strive to always bring your stories to life. Because your stories are more than just words. Newsday, independent and credible. Gift giving during a lockdown can still be hassle free with a gift from Fanzone with delivery options available nationwide. Visit and browse our Facebook and Instagram pages for all your official licensed merchandise and apparel and have it delivered to your door. Find us on Facebook and Instagram. Fanzone, we've got you covered. Laptops and tablets are at thebesttoys.com. Get a Gateway 14.1 inch Ultra Slim Notebook or an HP 14 inch laptop at the best prices in TNT. Get the Fire 7 tablet for $474. You can also shop the latest Amazon Fire Sticks. Call now at 32 DBEST to order or visit us in store at Forces Flagship Math Bean. Shop online now at thebesttoys.com. Free delivery available throughout Trinidad and Tobago. Cash or links on delivery. There's a taste in the air everywhere Feel the vibe cause it's so good to share Smooth, rich and creamy, you'll find it right here Mix your smile, relax a while, it's fun and good chair
something special. Come along, enjoy your treats. This is Uncle Pete's. If you live with someone who's tested positive for COVID-19 and has to self-isolate at home, take care of them from a distance and reduce their movement around the house. Give them space, a designated space, and open those windows. If you have to be in contact, mask up, both of you. If you work, stay home from work and don't go out not even to the grocery or pharmacy. And remember, no visitors allowed. Limit the contact to limit the spread. The Trinidad and Tobago Red Cross Society. Mission-based, people-focused, community-driven. All right, welcome back to the program. As we continue to look around the region this morning, we're going to St. Lucia, where HTS News Force is reporting on a story of a fatal shooting on Saturday night. A victim, uh, 21 years old, he was from the area called West Hall Group. He was shot several times about his body. Members of the community who knew him said he was not involved in any crime. He certainly wasn't a member of any gang. Gang violence in St. Lucia. Let's take a look. A small bar in the community of Viewfort would become the latest location to suffer the wrath of gun-wielding intruders. On Monday afternoon, around 12.15 p.m., police were summoned once again to Hospital Road, where on Saturday, 21-year-old Jesus Blanchard lost his life to gun violence. Law enforcement has now launched another investigation into the circumstances surrounding Monday afternoon's shooting that resulted in one man having to be taken to hospital. Streets were cordoned off as police canvassed the neighborhood to ensure safety and gather crucial evidence to help in solving the latest shooting incident. The Royal St. Lucia Police Force urges anyone with information regarding the fatal shooting in Viewfort on Saturday night and the shooting on Monday afternoon to contact the Viewfort Police Station at 456-3905 or the crime hotline at 45CRIME for anonymous reporting. And we'll hear this report from TVJ in Jamaica. They say the Jamaica Agriculture Society is raising concern about retailers engaging in price gouging. In recent months, the prices of agricultural inputs such as fertilizers and insecticides have been steadily rising. The driving factors, supply chain issues and the war in Ukraine. President of the Jamaica Agricultural Society, Lenworth Fulton, believes some local stores have been increasing their prices too much. It's why he wants a survey of farm input prices to be conducted. Well, I think they should do a survey which would give information and to expose those who are overdoing it. I think a survey now is necessary. With all what is happening, we have not seen a survey. I don't know who would be responsible for doing the survey, but it would give information and it would make us more sure-footed in our planning. We need information right now. The government has been providing subsidies to farmers to cushion the effects of the rising prices. But Mr. Fullerton says so far the subsidies have not tempered the increase. In the meantime, the JAS boss says he expects the shortage of fertilizer to continue for at least another year. At least one supplier, Newport First Sand Jamaica, has said it might have to cut back production due to the rising cost of manufacturing the agricultural input. But the government have really have some measures, some subsidies that they are putting in there. And we have some fertilizer from Morocco that are being distributed now. So I think that will help to ease the pressure a little. But the war in Ukraine continuing is anybody's guess when this thing will be over. And that'll do it for us. That's our broadcast for this Wednesday morning. We thank you for watching and we thank all our guests as well. And we tell you uh, in about half an hour, we go back to the news at the top of the hour, followed by today's edition of Talking Point with Shah and Small. For now, I'm Andy Johnson. Thanks for watching. We we'll see you tomorrow.